Okay, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you, brothers and sisters, for attending the class. Uh, what Elder Lawyer went into uh, was pretty good. Uh, him going into uh, the breakdown as far as certain Christian dogma. And uh, I heard someone ask about the virgin birth, and I thought that we would actually tackle that along with some other things uh, in a short span of time if the Most High allow it this Sabbath. Um, first and foremost, I don't know if you notice, but people tend out there to take clips from our teachings or probably a few second snippet from our teachings and they, they'll just take one part of what we say and then make a complete hour or two video off of it claiming this is what we are saying. I don't know if you've all recognized, no one ever take our clips and let what we're teaching actually play out so that people can understand what we're teaching. And see, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say that that's deception in itself. That's a clear deception. If you want the people to know what we're saying, just play out the whole thing. And people do that. I'm going to tell you why they do this. I'm going to go into it in a moment. And I'm going to give it an example. They'll take a snippet of something and say, well, the gathering of Christ church don't believe in the virgin birth. And they'll take a snippet and those that run into the video will believe what they're saying or will believe that we said what this person who is actually against the work is saying. So they use our image and then they'll come in with their own jargon or spin to deceive the people into saying that we are teaching something we are not teaching. So you have to be aware of that. That's straight deception. All right. Now, when it comes to the virgin birth, I thought we would tackle it. It's something we actually tackle within the Hebrew Academy in detail. We've actually put the videos out online many days even before the Academy was there, but I thought we would teach it again in detail so you will have it for yourself to know that the knowledge is for everyone. We don't hold no knowledge back, all right? The Academy is a, is a student and teacher setting. It's an entirely different setting than us just teaching online like we're doing right now. There's materials involved, uh, there's quizzes involved, there's test scores involved. This is for people who are trying to up their vocation and learn the Bible along with us in a short amount of time and is willing to sacrifice uh, some finances, only $50 a month to do so. Therefore, our time and expenses for what we actually do behind the scenes are taken care of. All right, so that's what that is about. But I wanted to break down the um, the virgin birth, and this is why I'm going to break this down today. We don't have much time, but I'm going to do it anyway. This is why Christians now are jumping on this thing to attack Israelites. Well, Israelites don't believe in the virgin birth. This is what Christians must understand, and this is our statement to Christians. We believe in a different Christ than you. And I want Christians to understand that. We don't believe in the same Christ. So when you try to equate what we're teaching 
with what you're teaching. You cannot. Because what Christians are teaching today stems from paganism. You're not teaching the truth according to Christ. All right? So you can't make bold statements. One thing when people try to make these snippets about the virgin birth, they leave this out. And I need everyone who might make a future video with the Gathering of Christ Church speaking of the virgin birth to add this in. We believe that Christ is the Savior. We believe Christ is the first begotten of the Father. We believe that Christ was with the Father in the beginning and created everything we see today. We believe that Christ came in the earth as a sacrifice based on the children of Israel having the law of sacrifice in the Old Testament for the atonement of sin. We believe that Christ paved the way so that those who believe in the first begotten of the Father, which is Christ, shall be saved. We believe that no man cometh to the Father but through Christ. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by him. Make sure you add all that in when you are bringing forth the gathering of Christ don't believe in the virgin birth. Because what they're really doing out there, brothers and sisters, they're just, this is what they're really bringing. They're really bringing the fact, they're trying to just put that out there that the gathering of Christ don't believe in Christ. Or Israelites don't believe in Christ. Let me make it clear. We can believe in Christ and not follow the virgin deities of ancient Babylon and Rome. Because there were virgin births while Christ was walking on the earth, which were under satanic doctrine. You understand? What we are saying is, we're not going to follow the pagan deities of Rome who hijacked Christ's teachings and brought forth paganism so that they can usher in their virgin deities that were in place before Christ came to the earth, that was, in, that was on, in the earth while Christ was walking. Christ was actually converting and the disciples were converting pagans out of that belief. So are we going to use Christ's name to bring people back to paganism? So that's the point. Now, for the record, so that everyone can understand, and I know people might take snippets of this in one point without allowing everything to be broke down in its entirety. So what we'll do is we'll make a video in its entirety and put it out there. Knowing that people just listen for things, certain button points, so they can make a whole video and say, this is what the gathering of Christ believe. We believe that Christ is the Savior, but we understand that the Antichrist doctrine have been injected within mainstream society, mainly due to the deception of the European doctrine of Roman Catholicism. Need you to get a few scriptures for me, brother. Mm -hmm. Go to St. John 5 and 38 and 39. And I need you to also get the scripture that says, He that believeth on me as the scripture have said. I notice a lot of people are trying to make, a vi make videos based on this work. This proves that through the spirit of the Most High, that the, this truth is resonating through everything. You got Muslims, Christians, Israelites, everyone trying to make something against the gathering of Christ church. But to me, I, 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 listen, we welcome it. Because actually the truth is resonating and tearing down the strongholds and all these other factions. The majority of Israelites are coming against the truth because we, we're telling people the name of the Most High according to what he said with his own mouth. They can't attack that. So they're coming in different variants uh, now with, with that. Go to St. John 5 and 30, uh, 39 first. Uh, St. John chapter 5 verse 39. Go ahead. Search the scriptures. Read it again. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Read. For in them 
you think you have eternal life. For in them you think you have eternal life. Now why did Christ say that? That you think you have eternal life. Why? Because people are not searching the scriptures according to sound doctrine. They are searching the, the scriptures to defend the doctrine they was brought up from their youth. It's a difference. So the Bible tells us to, to destroy and tear down every imagination that exalted itself against the power of the Most High. Read, read on. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. For in them you think you have eternal life. Go ahead. And they are they which testify of me. And they, and these scriptures testify of Christ. What we're saying is we're going to tell you the truth of Christ. If we were to follow what Christians are saying about Christ, then you would have saw us in church on Easter Sunday. Claiming that, they, that, that, that they're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. When no place in the Bible did Christ tell you to celebrate his resurrection. Therefore, nowhere in the Bible did it tell, tells us to follow Christ's, uh, Christ's virgin birth. And Mary, as a virgin mother who had the child of, you know, the child of God. That's all pagan. It's no place where the disciples said this was a prerequisite in following Christ. We're going to show you that according to the teachings of the scriptures, they that believe on Christ not having a physical father is actually the spirit of Antichrist. And we're going to prove it out of the Bible. Now some people, they'll probably look at this and just take what I just said from there and make a video out of that. Okay, but I'm going to prove everything we're saying. Get your pad and your pencils, your paper, write down the scriptures. And we're going to show you beyond any shadow of a doubt that Christ had an actual physical father and a spiritual father. You got that? Leave for me as the scripture is it. Get that. Uh, St. John chapter 7 verse 38. Read. Uh, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said. Read it again. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said. Okay, now we have no doubt that Christians believe on Christ. But the problem is, they're not believing on him as the scripture hath saith. Because the scripture didn't tell you to celebrate his resurrection and on Easter Sunday and all that other stuff that, that y'all doing. So you're believing on another Christ. And Paul even said, if you come, if anyone come to your door and bring another Christ, let him be accursed. Read it again. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said. Go ahead. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his bellies shall flow rivers of of living water. Another thing Christians are teaching that we have to get straight. Another statement they're bringing out there that 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 God loves the sinner and hates the sin. What scripture is that? Okay. God hates. Let's make this clear. I'm gonna make it clear. God hates all sin. Period. Now, if you repentant of sin, then he accepts and loves. Let's go to Proverbs 8 and 17. You can't say that God don't love the sinner. That's a lie. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. Read it. I love them that love me. Read it again. I love them that love me. I love them that love me. That's crystal clear. Now, how do you love the Most High? Hold that and go to 1 John, the fifth chapter, in the first verse. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 1. Read it. 
Whosoever believeth that Yeshua is the Christ is born of the Most High. If you believe that that Christ is the anointed, you're born of the Most High, read. And everyone that loveth him, that begot loveth him, also that is begotten of him. Verse 2. Go ahead. By this we, we know that we love the children of the Most High. This is how we know we love the children of the Most High, read. When we love the Most High and keep his commandments. When we what? When we love the Most High and keep His commandments. Christians is telling people it's sin to keep the, mo the Most High's commandments. And I'm reading this out of the New Testament. That's the love of God. You cannot say you love the Most High and scorn His commandments. And say that the, the, the commandments and laws are done away with. So if you're breaking the commandments and you are against the commandments of the Most High, you hate God. If you follow the commandments according to the New Testament, you love God. Read. Verse 3. For this is the love of God. What is the love of God? For this is the love of God. Go ahead. That we keep his commandments. That we say the law is done away with. That we keep his commandments. That we throw the commandments to the, to the side. That we keep his commandments. Read. And his commandments are not grievous. And his commandments are not hard. Grievous means they are not hard. Just a small example. The same aisle you go to to get your pork chops, you can get lamb chops. That's a choice. It's not hard to choose what's right. That's a choice. See that? So it's, here's the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Go back to Proverbs 8 and 17 again. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. Read. I love them that love me. So the Most High love those who love him. So if you keep in his commandments, he loved you. If you are sinning on purpose and think you are excused because you was born that way, the Most High hate you. That, that's called reprobate. Like homosexuals running around saying, well, God made me this way. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And I'm going to show you the importance of this. They ease this sin within the churches. How? By first getting people conditioned to believe in that God's law is done away with. If, law, if there's no law, then homosexuals and everything else that's against the Most High can thrive and not be talked about. There's no repentance in the church because the law is done away with. So now homosexuals can now take the authority positions. That's the reason they set those things up. So that the evil that created the church, which is the Roman Catholic Church at the very end, would allow all types of reprobates to run loose in the Most High's church. Hope you all can see that. So now I noticed that people, people that I didn't know at all that was watching these particular videos from the Gathering of Christ Church, everyone got a video on the virgin birth. Oh, we got something now, the virgin birth. We, I didn't even know these people, you know what the whole deal was? The truth was tearing their religion down for years, and they had nothing that they can really point to. So now they're going to focus on the virgin birth. So you know what, brothers and sisters? When someone asked the lawyer that question, I said, you know what, we're going to come and we're going to deal with this virgin birth once and for all with the precepts. And let's see if a Christian or anyone else will get online and go through all the precepts we, we're about to bring out. Let's see if they do that. Because if they, because if they go through these precepts, there's no way possible Christians can say that Joseph was not Christ's physical father. Now the spirit is something else. The spirit was there from the beginning. But I'm going to make a bold statement. And I know people would probably just take a snippet and say, well, this is what he said and put it out there. Joseph was Christ's father. And I don't have to be ashamed of, of saying that. He was his father. We have been programmed from a child to believe in these pagan deities. Understand that. A lot of you out there think that Joseph is just some third word, will. Some guy that just was walking around, but Mary is the center of attention. 
I've spoken to Christians that don't even know that Mary had other children. As if she was a woman that, that didn't deal with a man or something. Don't you know that Christ was the big brother of brothers and sisters? We're going to go through some of these things for you. See, the Christian church had to bring that forth based on the pagan deity they had from ancient Babylon. There's a book called The Two Babylons. Okay? Title, Reverend Alexander Hislop. And what he did, he went into the history and he paralleled all the ancient deities and all the ancient uh, 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 virgins that was worshipped through time and paralleled them with the modern European Catholic Church to prove that they never left paganism. They're just using Christ's name, God's name, Mary's name, but it's the same, it's the same pagan gods that they were worshipping in ancient times. And all those pagan gods come from what? Satan. They're the worshiping of the involuntarily worship of angels, which is fallen angels, demigods, women with certain powers and all those things, goddesses and gods. This is what the Romans worship. The Romans set up your Western world. The Romans are the Jewish powers today. So they have tricked you into following this virgin woman. When the virgin woman did not start with Mary. They used the word virgin to get you. Then they taught you as a child that virgin means a woman who have never had intercourse. That's a lie. You got your Bible dictionary. Good. Let me show something out of here first. And then we're going to go into the Bible dictionary. And we're going to go through each scripture in detail. Okay, here's an old, here's an old uh, 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 Roman coin of the Yule, the Yule log with the serpent wrapped around it. That's number one. You know, some people might ask, well, what is this? The Yule log is the log of the virgin child that's burned in your fireplace every December 25th. Yes. Coming out of the fire, who's come out? Who comes out of the fire? Satan. Who's the child that was born December twenty-fifth? Nimrod. Satan's child that fought against the Most High, that built the tower to fight against the Most High in Genesis the eleventh chapter. Now you got the Yule log. They're claiming that a tree stump is left, which was Nimrod's tree, and which Nimrod, when Nim, they say when Nimrod died a tree erected over his grave. And every December 25th, the, the slaves or the plubs had to decorate the tree and put gold and silver around it. And you can read about that in Jeremiah the 10th chapter. But all Christians are still celebrating Christmas. And what, what was left was a stump, which, was, which is called a Yule log. Y-U-L-E, which means the child's log. So every year during Christmas, you must chop down a tree and put a log in the fireplace. All your commercials have the log burning. That's Satan coming out of the fire in representation of the Yule child, Nimrod, the virgin child. But we have a problem if we say, let's examine this. When Christ says in Matthew 24, that many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now there's more. See, we don't do any research. We just go to church and believe everything these Christian pastors tell us, not realizing, not understanding that these Christian pastors are, were set up by Romans. You are dealing with a slave doctrine. If you believe the people that run this earth that have set up your churches are following God, you are sadly mistaken. They are Satanists at its highest level. They're the ones who gave you Christianity. Now, it so happened that the mother, child, and son don't stop with the Roman Catholic Church in Europe. You can find this in Asia. And they wasn't believing in Mary and Christ, but you can find a virgin child there. 
Okay? In India, there's a virgin child and mother. But they, but they don't believe in Christ and Mary. Okay? Let me read this for you. One moment here. And if you can, if you don't, if you don't have this book, please get yourself a, the PDF. Go to Google and, PD and, and, and type in Two Babylons PDF and read it. It will blow your mind if you're looking into the virgin children. Just type in virgin birth before Jesus Christ. Christ been hijacked. The whole world is believing on another Christ, especially those Christians in this Western world. You are believing in Satan. Okay? There's more. I'm going to read this from page 91 to Babylon's. The festivals of Rome are innumerable, but five of the most important may be singled out for elucidation. Christmas Day, Lady Day, Easter, the, nati the Nativity of St. John, and the Feast of the Assumptions. Each and all of those can be proved to be Babylonian. And first, as to the festival to honor the birth of Christ or Christmas. How come is that this festival was concerted with the 25th of December? There is not a word in the scriptures about the precise day of Christ's birth. Now this implies that at what time soever his birth took place, it could not have been on the 25th of December. At that time, the angel announced his birth to the shepherds of Bethlehem. They were feeding their flocks by night in the open fields. Now, no doubt the climate of Palestine is not so severe as the climate of this country. But even there, through the, through the heat of the day, though the heat of the day be considerable, the cold of the night from December to February is very piercing. And I know in the Middle East, even at nighttime, you can't have no, no baby outside in the dead of winter and have that baby live through that. So Christ was born in a manger outside. There's no way he could have been born on December 25th. So why are we celebrating December 25th? That's a lesson in itself. But this still goes back to the virgin child. The virgin child was born December 25th. Why? Because of the spring solstice. They claim uh, uh, Ceramicus, his mother of Babylon. They claim she came down in an egg of the, uh, and hatched in the river Euphrates during the spring solstice. And she was impregnated after that. And when you count nine months from the spring, yes, you get what? You get Christmas. That's when Nimrod was born. That's that virgin child, not Christ. So if you want to talk about the virgin birth, we must bring this thing all the way around and show you the history. The Western world have never taught the truth of Christ. They're Satanist. They have tricked you by using Christ's name and they have given you pagan deities and virgin deities of gods and goddesses to worship. Now I can believe in Christ and not believe in that. Because I can just believe in the things that Christ says. That's why he, he mentioned it. If you believe on me, as the scripture hath saith. So I'm not going to believe in Christ any other way. I'm not going to hear what my preacher got to say if it's not what Christ said. I'm, I'm not going to hear what anyone have to say. I'm going to do the research. I'm going to open up the books. Open up the history books. The strong concordances. I'm going to make sure I'm worshiping the Christ that's written. And not the Christ my slave master gave to me. More. Before we go into this. I need the picture of the Babylonians mother and child. One moment. Stick with me brothers and sisters. Stick with me here. Here you go. 
Here's some images from India and from ancient Babylon, just so we can show you some of the ancient Im images. You can go to these places as we speak today and find images all over the old world just like this, mother and child. But none of these people are Christ and Mary. So how is it that the same story of a virgin mother and child went out throughout the four corners of the earth in different languages? Well, it's easy. At one time before the splitting of the tongues in Genesis the 11th chapter, all people were worshiping Ceramuses, Simramuses, and her son Nimrod, and they was all speaking one language. When the Most High split the tongue, they took those same religions to different lands with different languages. And through time, they kept that virgin child uh, uh, myth alive in the earth under their particular language. So it's no wonder Christians now can go into different areas of different languages and bring forth their doctrine to bring everybody under one religion. Why? Because what they're doing is relating the same religion they had before the tongues were split. So it's easy to relate a virgin mother and a, a virgin mother and a child with every society because they all was following Nimrod and Talmuz in ancient times before the tongue was split. Our people were not to deal with this. We were not to deal with this as a people. Why? Because we had knowledge of the Babylonian queen mother of heaven. Let's get that real quick. In Jeremiah. We had knowledge not to follow the queen mother of heaven. And this is the perfect time to go into this lesson right after Easter. Christians have no idea why they in church on every Easter Sunday. Okay? Easter is the goddess of star or Ceramicus. Ceramicus, the mother of Nimrod and Talmud. So that's why you're there every, every Sunday, Easter Sunday. It have nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. No place in the Bible does it tell us to celebrate the, the resurrection of Christ. The pagan the, the pagan Satanists set that up under who? Constantine, a, dr a blood drinker, a child sacrificer, a Satanist. They set that up under him to hijack the truth of Christ so that pagans could stop converting into Christ's teachings. It was pagans converting themselves into what we believed as Hebrews. They didn't want that. So they integrated this in 325 AD under Constantine in the Council of Nicaea and they made a compromise and integrated pagan worship with Christ's titles and Christ's names. It made everyone believe that was the Christianity we were supposed to follow. We were tricked as a people. And the virgin birth is one of the biggest deceptions on earth. I can believe in Christ and not believe in the virgin birth. So we must study these scriptures and go all the way through it to make sure because Satan have attacked us on every level and made us believe in himself and his deities and the worship of him opposed to the worship of our true God, Ahiah, and his son, Yeshua. Now, let's read Jeremiah 8. Read. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. Jeremiah 7 and 18. Read it. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women net their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. And the women need their dough to make cakes to the queen mother of heaven. Read. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women net their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. To make cakes to the queen of heaven. So this is something that the Most High hated. We did this in the Old Testament where we got our food together and made it a holiday to deal with this queen of heaven. Who's the queen of heaven? The queen of heaven is the, your modern day Mary. Of course, she was called Semiramis in the Old Testament. But the pagans have tricked you by renaming her Mary, saying that she's the mother of God. 
Of course she's the mother of God. If, if Christ came through a virgin birth and that's God incarnate, this is what they're teaching. And none of this stuff is nowhere in scripture where Christ is God incarnate. So they're upholding this woman above Christ. So if you hold on to this virgin birth, you're actually holding up Mary as a deity. There's a whole concept behind this. And you're going right back into what we were following in ancient Babylon when the Most High destroyed us for following their gods. You got Hebrews today who are calling on the Babylonian God. Even Hebrews who know they're Hebrews. They, they've been tricked into following the Babylonian gods. And then you have it by calling on Baal. And then you have on our side Christians who've been tricked into following the Babylonian gods. So I can follow Christ and not follow a virgin birth. Why? Because in the Bible, there's no such Hebrew word as virgin. Get virgin out of your Bible dictionary for me, please. A uh, virgin. Go ahead. A young unmarried woman. A young unmarried woman. Uh, definition two. Let's hear the definition two. A young woman of marriageable age. A young woman of marriageable age. That means she's at the age in which she can have children. Usually when a woman is dealing with a cycle, she's at that age. Read. Whether married or not. Whether married or not. So whether she consummated marriage or not. When she came to that age, she was automatically called virgin. It had nothing to do whether or not she had intercourse according to the Bible dictionary's definition. Because marriage is consummation of the flesh. That's what marriage is. Let's prove that out of the Old Testament, that marriage is consummation of the flesh. Let's go to Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. Go, go before that. This is when Rebecca met Isaac. Now, mind you, she met Isaac for the first time. They have never met. They heard of each other. But this is the first time Isaac is meeting his wife to be Rebecca. Read. Genesis chapter 24, verse 64. Go ahead. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. She came off the camel. Verse 65. For she had said unto him, unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? So she asked the servant, Who is this man that walketh in the field to meet us? Go ahead. And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. See, and that's where you get the, uh, the veil in marriage ceremonies. They're getting it from this. According to the scripture, a woman is supposed to be shamefaced. So she would cover her face when she was going to meet her man. Read. Verse 66. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. Verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah. He took Rebekah. Go ahead. And she became his wife. And she became his wife. As you can see. There's nobody reading any vows there. There's no one sitting in front of them. There's no crowd. They consummated. And at that point, she became his wife. That's what marriage is according to scripture. Okay, the ceremony is optional. Okay, but it's not a prerequisite if two people agree. Christ says what he put together, let no man put asunder. And that's including a preacher. There was, no one, there was no magistrate there. And I'm saying this because a lot of brothers and sisters don't even know why the marriage certificates and all those things were even instituted in the Western world. There was no such thing as a marriage certificate in America until after they freed the slaves. They found out there were too many black people, black men marrying white people and all that. So they wanted to keep a record of it, to control it. 
So they instituted a marriage certificate and started teaching clergy, if anyone marry outside of government, tell them it's fornication and sin. When before that, slaves used to just jump the broom. They would jump the broom, then go into a house and consummate their marriage. So you have to realize the institutionalized thinking we have and believe in everything clergy and what, and what uh, uh, this world tells us. There's an agenda either through satanic worship or through systematic institution and institutionalized control of people. This is what they use clergy for, to worship their gods or to control the people. Christ says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we're going to, we're giving you the truth here. All right. Now there's more. Let's get into the virgin birth now. And when I got the truth uh, of the Bible, when I first got the truth of the Bible, I asked myself a question. The question I asked was, man, what haven't we been lied to about? What is it we haven't been lied to? Listen, in order to get the truth, you got to drop everything you've learned and learn again, which be the first principles and oracles of the Most High, like it says in Hebrews. And that's the truth. We've been lied to on everything. We got straight Satanists and pagans and, and straight Satan worshipers and child sacrifices and pedophiles and homosexuals who have given us our doctrine. Slave owners and people who are looking to control the minds of people. These are they who gave you your doctrine. So how can you say, how can you take their doctrine as the gospel? Let's get into this virgin thing real quick. So I, so I kind of figured when I was going to just let Elder Lawyer handle the class, but yeah, I played, I, but I was thinking, let, let's handle this once and for all. So that people can, cannot be thinking out there that we're just hoarding things for the academy because this is an academy lesson. But we've put this out even before the academy. All right. And another thing I want to say, those who believe that Christ was born of a virgin, that's your business. Okay, I, we can't stop you from believing whatever you want to believe. As long as you walk like Christ and follow Christ, those are the key things. All right? But we're going to give you the history of what the virgin birth is. It's not just a virgin birth. There's a whole philosophy and belief system that comes with that understanding. That's what we'll give you. And from that point, you have a choice whether or not you want to follow it. We want to follow Christ regardless of how he was born. Let's make that clear. Because nowhere in the scriptures does it say that you must believe that Christ was born of a virgin and Mary was a virgin. Of, of the definition of virgin this society gives you. Okay? Because when people ask, well, do you believe in the virgin birth? And we come, we answer straight up. Well, yeah, we believe in the virgin birth, but not the virgin birth they're teaching in the churches. We believe that according to the Hebrew, virgin means maiden. Because that's what it means. In the Old Testament, virgin and maiden is synonymous. They're interchangeable. But the Christians and the pagans could not use the word maiden. Why? Because they were looking to bring forth a deity they were worshiping already, which was a virgin or untouched woman. Maiden, don't, don't do that for them. Okay? First, Research the ideology of those who gave you your religion. Okay. The Roman Catholics is the mother of harlots. She is the one. The Roman Catholic Church set up all your Christian churches in America. Okay. So know what their agenda is to understand the virgin birth. All right. Now. I need you to get the one we have in uh, Deuteronomy. What's it, the 33rd chapter? 22. The 22nd chapter, mm -hmm. yeah. Deuteronomy 22. And let's go to Romans, the first chapter. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Read it. Concerning his son, Yeshua Christ, our oh, Lord. Hold up. I want you to read it exactly like you see it, just in case Christians are reading this. So we're going to use the words, even though we know Christ's name is not Jesus, there was no J's when Christ was walking the earth. All right? But just for edification, we're going to read it like we see it in case a Christian run into this and only know the word Jesus. We don't want to be a barbarian unto our own people. So we're going to read it just for the sake of edification. We don't believe in the word Jesus because there was no J's during Christ's time. So let's put that on the record. But we're going to mention exactly how it's written just for edification because some people will look at it and they'll just say, well, what word did he say? Well, I don't believe in him. He's, he's changing words in the Bible. That's what people do. Mm -hmm. And they'll ignore the whole purpose of us reading this in the first place. So let's just stick with, with it as it is written. Read it. In Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Go ahead. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Which was made of the seed of David. He was made of the seed of David. So if you want to know how Christ was made. He was made of the seed of David. All right. Now, let's examine that for one moment. I need you to go on your Strong's Concordance. Right. We're going to pull up a Strong's Concordance. And for all you scholars out there. If you are a Christian, get yourself a Strong's Concordance. If you're looking at us on the computer, type in Concordance on your Google and get Concordance. What is a Concordance? A Concordance is the words of your Bible in the Hebrew of the Old Testament and in the Greek of your New Testament. Okay? That's what a Concordance is. So you'll know what word was there before the English translation. All right? That's what a concordance is, all right? So I need you to follow me so that we can look at this together as scholars, studying on a scholarly level to see what's being written here. Romans 1 and 3. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Read. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. His son. So we don't believe that Christ is God. Let's make that clear. Matter of fact, we know Christ is not God. Christ is the Son of God, which means there was a time in which the Father was to himself before he created or pulled the Son out of himself. Christ is in essence from the Most High. He's the first begotten of the Most High. He's not the Most High. And if you read this verse, it's telling you clear he's not. Read it again. Concerning his Son. His Son, not him. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. Okay, what you got in the Strong's Concordance there for seed? Uh, we have Strong's number 4690. 4690, which, say the word for me. Uh, sperma. Say it again. Sperma. Sperma and the Greek. Spell the word sperma for me, Elder Lawyer. S-P-E-R-M-A. Christ was made with the sperma of man. Romans 1 and 3, read it. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The sperma of David according to the flesh. According to the spirit, brother. According to the flesh. So when the spirit overshadowed Mary that you read in the book of Luke, that's when the spirit that came from the heavenly father came down into her. But that still don't take away from the fleshly side of sperma. The same as we all, brothers and sisters, we have a spirit side and we have a flesh side. All spirits were created in the beginning with the Most High. He sends the spirit into the earth. But the flesh part must happen also. Oh, 
you understand that. So the sperma came from David, but the spirit came from the Most High. And we're going to clear up that in Luke and Matthew so you can totally understand what we're saying here. All right. First of all, what the Christians did was deceitful in the compilation because they put Luke's account first in the in the birth of Christ or the pregnancy of Mary. They put Luke's account first, which was wrong. Why? In Luke, the first chapter, that was before she was pregnant. In, in Matthew, the first chapter, when you read, she was already found with child. So the Luke's account is supposed to have been first in chronological order, but the Christians purposely put that one second. So that when you read through Matthew and then read through Luke, you would believe that Luke is chronologically after Matthew's account. Because we know that the first chapter of Luke is before Mary had intercourse. In Matthew, the first chapter, she was already pregnant. Now, if you're going to understand the marriage of the Hebrews and what was going on with Joseph and Mary, and that conflict in Matthew, the first chapter, when he was looking to put her away, you must first go into the history of a Hebrew wedding. Why was Joseph looking to put away Mary? Let's see. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter. Let's start at like the 13th verse. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 13 Read If any man take a wife If any man take a wife And go in unto her and hate her He go in unto her That means he had intercourse with her But then he found reason not to like her anymore Verse 14 And give occasions of speech against her And then he starts speaking against her Saying that I don't want to be with her For whatever reason Go ahead and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. So he's saying, when I came to her, I found her not a what? Found her not a maid. I found her not a maid. As you can see, maid and virgin is the same exact word. What he's saying was, I had an agreement to, to have her as wife, and I found out that before she was tied with me, she dealt with someone else. So there was a law concerning this in the Old Testament. Read. Verse 16. And the damsel's father shall, excuse me, verse 15. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel, damsel's virginity. So if a guy was to bring up some accusations against his wife, the father and mother would come with proof that the exchange was righteous. Why? The father would have the token of virginity. Now some might ask, what is the token of virginity? The token of virginity is a sheet that the father gives the son-in-law to be. In exchange for a dowry, which is the son will pay a certain amount to the father for the exchange. In, ex in exchange, the father gets, gives him a sheet he gives the father the money. So on the day of coming together, they would consummate in a secret chamber with the same sheep the father had given the son-in-law to be. The tokens of virginity is the blood that comes from a woman that have not been touched. The blood would come down on the token of virginity. They would wash off. He would, he would show it before the families, both families, they would share and have a reception. So really the consummation came before the wedding ceremony. Before what you would call the, uh, what they call that, the, the, the reception. Mm -hmm. The reception, believe it or not, came afterwards, not before. Pagans do it where you have a party before, then the honeymoon. And that's madness in itself because the honeymoon was is some old pagan ritual where someone will grab a woman and kidnap her away from her family. 
look up Honeymoon and keep her away from her family and rape her. That's what Honeymoon is. So our whole way, our whole system is pagan and is evil. Back then, a man would give cash or whatever cattle or whatever the case is, the father would give a sheet for an exchange and then after they consummated and the woman cleaned herself and they would put on their white and go out before the, the party, he would show the sheet, fold it up and give it to the father so that the father can have proof that the exchange was righteous according to Hebrew law. That's a Hebrew wedding. So you must understand that first before you start reading Matthew 1 and breaking down why Joseph was looking to put away Mary. He was looking to put away Mary according to the Hebrew law. Now there's more according to this law. A man comes up and has certain words against the woman because he don't like the woman no more. Now he's claiming that she was touched by someone else before she was given to him. Read. Verse 15. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity. So they'll take the blood that's on the sheet. Unto the elders of the city and the gate. So the elders of the city who presided over things, because there was all records, they would go to him and say, listen, here's, they would go to them and say, here's the tokens of virginity for the exchange. Read. Verse 16. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this, to this man to wife. I gave my daughter unto this man, read. And he hated her. Verse 17, and lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her. Now he's given an occasion of speech against her. Read. Same, same. I found not thy daughter a maid. I found not thy daughter a maid. To show you that the word in the Hebrew is maid, not virgin. Virgin falls under the Greek deities, under the Roman deities. Why? Because they were following and worshiping virgin deities. Even Virgo itself is a pagan Roman deity. Read. I found not thy daughter a maid. I found not thy daughter a maid. Read. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. Yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. I can show you proof that he laid with my daughter and it was a righteous exchange. Go ahead. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. They shall spread out the sheet so the elders can see it. Go ahead. Verse 18. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And the elders will go get this man and say, why are you trying to bring up accusations against this sister who did nothing wrong? Read. Verse 19. And they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver. And then you had to pay the family for soiling their name. Read. And give them unto the father of the damsel. So the father was paid for you damning his name. Read. Because he have brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. You see how it says virgin there? Why? Because virgin is the same as maid or maiden. When you look at the Hebrew, do this yourself in your Strong's Concordance, you will see that maiden is the same Hebrew word as virgin. There's no difference. Read. And she shall be his wife. And she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. And he cannot do that again. Read. Verse 20, but if this thing be true. But if what the brother is saying is true, that means there was no blood on the sheep when the father gave them the sheep and they consummated. Read. And the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel. And the token of virginity be not found. That means no blood came down. Read. Verse 21. Then shall they bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house. They will bring her to the door of her father. Read. And the men of her city shall stone her with stones. And the men of her city shall what? Shall stone her, stone her with stones. The men of the city shall kill that woman. So according to the law, if this man was to deal with her and no blood is on the sheet, he had the right to get her killed. Read. Because she have wrought folly in Israel. Because she have wrought folly in Israel. Now, my question to you, brothers and sisters, and you need to think. If Joseph never touched Mary, 
Why was he afraid to go forth with the ceremony? Why was he afraid that if they came together that they would kill Mary? If, she, if God touched her and no one else touched her. See, this is why they tell Christians don't read the Old Testament. They tell Christians to stay away from the Old Testament because the Old Testament fills in the blanks of what you're missing reading the new. How can you read the end or the middle of a story and get understanding? You don't open up any book and read the middle of the book. You would question their whole doctrine concerning the virgin birth if you understood how Hebrews were married in the Old Testament. But there's more. Let's go to Luke, the first chapter. And let's go to Matthew's, the first chapter. Go to Romans 1 and 3 and hold Romans 1 and 3 in that. And let's go to Acts, the second chapter. Luke chapter 1, verse 29. Hold Luke 1. Mm -hmm. Go to Romans 1 and 3. Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Concerning Jesus Christ, our Lord. Which was made of the seed of David. Which was made of the sperma, the sperm of David. You look in that word seed, it's sperm. Read. According to the flesh. Not according to the spirit. So now that's separating the spirit from the flesh. So we know that it's the most high spirit, which was the first begotten of the father. But it's through David's sperm, Christ will be made. Y'all follow me here? Read. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. According to the spirit. According to the flesh. Hold Romans, go to Romans 8 and 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Read it. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. That it was weak through the flesh. The Most High sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He sent his Son in the likeness of what? Of sinful flesh. Of what? Of sinful flesh. Of sinful flesh. Now some people might say, well, it's talking about the seed, talking about the woman. It's not talking about the woman. It's talking about the man. You have some Christians who even go back to the the woman's curse in Genesis 3 talking about the seed of the woman see I thought a woman can't have seed it's talking about the children who would come through Eve you had Cain who slew, slew his brother Abel it was still talking about Adam's physical seed that would come through Eve okay women do not have sperma Women do not have seed. So if this scripture is saying that Christ came through the seed of David, and the Most High swore with an oath that he would come through this seed, if there's no sperm involved, then the Most High is not given a true oath. And we know that's not correct. I'd rather believe the Most High than the Roman Catholic pagans. All right? Let's go back to Romans 1 and 3 and let's read Acts the second chapter. Romans chapter 1 verse 3. Go ahead. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Concerning Christ. Our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. According to the what? According to the flesh. According to the flesh. Read. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit. Now he's, let's do it, listen, now it's separating the flesh from the spirit. Read both again. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's the fleshly side. Read. Verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit. And according to the spirit, he's the son of the most high. So it's not taking anything away from him, saying that he came from the seed of David all the way down through Joseph's loins. Listen clearly. Christians would like to jump right to Matthew 1 and 18. And 
my question is, why go to Matthew 1 and 18 and not read the verses before Matthew 1 and 18? Because the first chapter of Matthew clearly tells us that Joseph is Christ's father. You want to see it yourself? Let's go to Matthew 1 and 1. St. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. And you know, we're going to do this for you. For the first time in reading this, for the sake of those who might be looking at this teaching for the first time, we're not going to skip anything. We're going to read every verse. And I want you to notice that even in the Old Testament, when it comes to lineages, the women are excluded. Why? The nation does not come through the women. Nation comes through the men. So you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, on and on and on. You'll see just men. Why? Women bear the, they actually bear the egg. They don't have a living organism that comes in and make life. They have what you would call an egg. But it's the sperm that have life. You, 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 you've seen this in hygiene where it swims around. That's the life and goes into the egg. That's when a woman can have all the eggs she wants. But if a sperm don't go into that egg, she will not have a baby. Once a month, the eggs come down when she's fertile so that the sperm don't have to travel too far. But it's the sperm that has life. And it goes into the egg. And the woman is like the earth that nurtures the seed until the seed comes to full age. So there's no such thing as mixed. Okay, The father bears the seed. The father bears the nation. There's no half this and half that. The sperm is of the man which defines the nation. Now, Christians want to read, go right to Matthew 1 and 18. But first, understand this, and I'm just speaking to Christians. You have no knowledge of a Hebrew marriage because you were taught not to even go into the Old Testament. Christ was a Hebrew. So in order to understand this scenario of Joseph and Mary, you need to go and find out how the Hebrews marry and stop equating this Western world marriage with what you're reading in Matthews. Okay? Now let's start at Matthew 1 and 1. We're not going to skip anything. We're going to read all the way down. St. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. Read on now. Verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brethren, and Judah begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar, and Perez begot Ezra, and Ezra begot Aram, and Aram begot Amenadab, and Amenadab begot Naasan, and Naasan begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begot Obed of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the Hold king. Hold up, these are all men through sperm. And Jesse begot who? David the king. David the king. Now we know in Romans 1 and 3, it promised that Christ would come through the seed of David according to the flesh. Right? So let's see how this materialized. Read. And David the king begot Solomon. And David begot who? Solomon. Solomon became king. So Christ would come through the king's loin, according to the oath you read in the book of Samuel. And in the book of Kings. So, make it clear. The lineage would come through the king's side, which was Solomon. Nathan, which is Mary's great-great-great-grandfather, did not have the throne. Solomon had the throne. Look at the lineage in Luke, the third chapter. After David, the lineage changed in the book of Luke. There's no contradiction. Luke is Mary's lineage. Matthew's is Joseph's lineage. So according to the scriptures, Christ would come through the throne of kings which was established through David and Solomon, and that in itself excludes Mary altogether because she didn't come through Solomon. She came through Nathan. Christians don't even deal with that. Clergy don't even deal with that, that Mary is not even in the equation. 
through the father's loins. Solomon sat on the throne, not Nathan. Nathan was Solomon's little brother. The, the throne belonged to David and Solomon. Read that again from Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. And, and what? And David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Read. Verse 7. And Solomon begot Rabbon, and Rabbon begot Abiah, and Abiah begot Asaph, and Asaph begot Josephat, and Josephat oh, begot... Oh, you, say, you say it's a little blurry? Okay, one moment. Let me straighten this out. Okay, we do apologize. Maybe the resonation is going to be a little less clear. We don't know, but we had to switch to a different computer. We was having technical difficulty. Let's get right back into it. Uh, you probably need to squeeze closer here. The bottom. Okay, that's good. That's good. We're good. All right, where we left off at con concerning the, the virgin birth was Matthew, the first chapter. All right. Now, we were reading all the way down until we got till, to Jesse and David, proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that Joseph was Christ's father according to lineage. Chapter and verse where you left off at, brother. Uh, St. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 10. Go ahead. And Ezekiel begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Amon, and Ammon begot Josiah, and Josiah begot Jeconiah, and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Salathiel, and Salathiel begot Zerob Zerobabel, and Zerobabel begot Abia, and Abia begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azar, and Azar begot Sadak, and Sadak begot Achim. And Achim begot Eliot, and Eliot begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Methun, and Methun begot Jacob. And Methun begot who? And Methun begot Jacob. This is a different Jacob, not Jacob the father, but Jacob down the lineages of, of uh, Judas or Judah or king. All the way down, read. Verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph. Through David. And Jacob ja begot who? Joseph. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. The what? The husband of Mary. The what? The husband of Mary. Now, based on what we're showing you here, in Luke, the first chapter, it's not speaking of Joseph and Mary being husband and wife, because at that time, there was no intercourse or no interaction to that degree. But in Matthew, the first chapter, it's showing Mary as the wife of Joseph and Joseph as the husband of Mary. So the question is why? On top of that, Christians like to go down to the 18th verse and ignore the lineages from one all the way down showing Joseph coming through David and Christ being the son of Joseph is right there before you go into the story of what's going on with Mary and Joseph trying to put her away and things of that nature. Read the last verse again. Verse 16. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. The husband of Mary. Of whom was born Jesus. Of whom was born Jesus. So, right there. Matthew 1 and 1. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The son of David. The son of David. The son of Abraham. The son of Abraham. This all happened through intercourse, through sperma, through sperm. Go down to the verse again. Verse 16. Where it says Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. The husband of Mary. Of whom was born Jesus. Of whom was born Jesus. So it's telling you right there. But Christians like to jump straight to the 18th verse of Matthew without, and they, they like to ignore the family lineage of how Christ was born before you get to the 18th verse. So how can they explain this? They don't. They said, well, Joseph did, uh, was looking to put her away because they would have seen her pregnant and they would have thought that she was pregnant by another man. This is what Christians tell you. And they would have stoned her. How would the people know that Joseph didn't deal with Mary? Why would they want to stone her 
for adultery or fornication when they wasn't married yet, right? So why are they looking to kill Mary? Why is Joseph looking to put her away privately? How would they know that she was impregnated by God like they're teaching in the Christian church? That's what they say. They say, well, Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant by God and didn't know what to do. They are lying. According to the Hebrew custom, blood must be on the token of virginity. So what Joseph was dealing with here, he was dealing with the fact that she was already dealt with and if they would have went through with the ceremony, no blood would have came down on the token and they would have stoned her. And he was minded, he talked to some people about it and they say, listen, you better put her away privately. Because they're going to kill her. Read it. Verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. This is the wisdom of how Christ was born. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Engaged to Joseph. Before they came together. Before they came together for what we see in the Old Testament, the token of virginity. Before the father gave the token. Before the money exchange happened, according to the Hebrew law, read. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. She was already pregnant with the child. The spirit have already overshadowed her and Joseph and her have already dealt before they went along with the ceremony. That's what is speaking of here. Why? Because the spirit overshadowed her in Luke. So this was after all that happened. She was already pregnant with Joseph's child. Read. Verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband. Hold up. They never dealt. So why is the scripture in Matthew calling Joseph her husband? According to Christians, nothing happened. If they didn't come together, why is the scripture in Matthew calling Joseph her husband? And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example. What public example? The public example we read in Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter. If no blood is on the token, they will stone her before her father's door. He didn't want her to die a death of a shameful woman before the magistrates, before the Sanhedrin. Read was minded to put her away privily. So he told some people about it, and they said, well, this is what you got to do. You got to put her away privately. You can't go through with this. Read. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things. So, but while he thought on it, he was praying about it. Read. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. Thou son of David. Now, mind you, Romans 1 and 3 says that he would come through the seed of David, thou son of David. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Don't be ashamed. Go through with it. Mary thy wife. Now, why is the angel calling Joseph Mary's husband and, and Mary his wife? Why is the angel acknowledging that? Read. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Because the Most High's power is in this woman. It's not just any spirit in this woman. It's the first begotting of the Father. That's what that means. So he told, the angel was telling Joseph, go through with it. I'm going to make everything fine. So this, don't, this does not take away from the Spirit of God because that's the Spirit of that was with the father from the beginning. So Joseph went along with it. He, he did everything right, and the Most High made sure that the marriage worked out perfectly fine in the eyes of men. But physically, according to the oath of the Most High, Joseph was Christ's father. From the flesh, seed of David, and from the spirit, the power and throne of the Most High, according to precept. When you go into the book of Luke, the third chapter, it shows you Mary's lineage. Mary's father name was Heli. 
when you go into Luke, Luke is speaking of before Joseph and Mary came together. So the story of Luke comes first. Now there's more. We have, we have a little more here. Go to Hebrews, the second chapter. So when Christians talk about this virgin birth and all those things, don't you just take snippets from what we say and make a class off of it without bringing forth the whole understanding of what we're teaching. Because it's, de it's deceiving the way they're putting it out there as if we don't believe in Christ. We don't believe in the pagan Christ that the Christians are teaching. According to the New Testament, the Bible you read, it tells us Christ could not have come like the Christians is saying. Why? They're claiming that God came down and impregnated a woman and had a child. According to mythology, that would make Christ a demigod, which is who the Romans worship, Zeus. He punished the angels for coming down sleeping with women and having children called Nephilim before the flood. That's an evil act. So if he's telling the angels not to come down and do such interaction, how can the Romans now taught that God himself came and impregnated a woman? You're going to find out that these are the same children of Nephilim the Catholic churches are following today. And they've tricked you into believing it was God who did this act. When it's the same demigods you're worshiping of ancient Rome. So we're saying examine the whole thing before you discount something. Know what the Romans are worshiping and what they are bringing forth before you defend that doctrine. Because according to the New Testament, it tells us Christ could not have been born that way. I'm going to show you. Read. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Yeshua, who was made a little lower than the angels. He was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he might, that he by grace of the Most High should taste death for every man. Go ahead. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are, are, whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I declare my name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which the Most High have given me. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Read that again. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and and blood. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, read. He also himself likewise took part of the same. Christ took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him with, that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So he had to come through flesh to destroy the sins of the flesh and destroy the power of the devil. He couldn't come no other way. Read. Verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Then you know that Satan used the fear of death to put us in fear and in bondage under his society. Read. Verse 16. For verily he took not, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. So he did not take on him the nature of angels. Read. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on him the what? The seed. Of Abraham. That seed in the Greek is sperm of Abraham. You cannot get around that. And it's going to tell you in this same chapter why he took on the sperm of Abraham. Read. Verse 17. Wherefore in all things. And in all things, that's including how he was born. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. He had to come just like us. Read that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things to pertaining to the Most High, 
to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He had to come like us to make reconciliation for our sins. Why? Because if he came a different way, we can use that as an excuse not to be like him. If he came in some angelic way, we would say, well, listen, that was Christ. No one can be Christ. That's God's child. So he, he came the same way we came so that we cannot use his birth as an excuse not to follow him and be like him. It tells you that. Read verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He suffered himself being tempted because he came in the flesh. He suffered the same temptations a normal man go through. Read. He is able to secure them that are tempted. He able to secure us who are tempted. We can look at him who came in the flesh and overcame it and say, you know what? We can do the same because he came just like us. And, and he showed us how to overcome sin. If he came through, through this immaculate thing, we would use that as an excuse not to follow him. And no wonder why Christians use Christ as an excuse for sin. Well, that's Christ. No one's perfect. We can't follow him. And we use his birth as an example not to follow the law. We say, well, that's Christ. He's special. Look how he was born. But if you take that out of the way, there's no excuse, according to the Bible. So now if Christ came just like you and overcome sin, what is our excuse? So when we talk about the virgin birth, it's deeper than just Mary not having sex with a man or having sex with a man. It's the whole concept of the virgin birth is a lie. They're saying God broke his own law by coming down, dealing with a woman and impregnating a woman. The same thing he punished the fallen angels for. So all that is encompassed. And the fact that the Roman Catholic Church today is following demigods, which are children of fallen angels, no wonder they have tricked you into believing that God did the same sin he took down the fallen angels for. So wake up. It's deeper than just the virgin birth. It's the whole concept. They're they, they not teaching the Hebrew custom of marriage. Why Joseph really was looking, he didn't know what to do with her. They're not teaching none of that. They just need you to believe in Zeus, the fallen angel, who, came, who, who definitely came and slept with women. That's what they need you to believe in. Hey, Zeus or Jesus. Okay, one more in the Apocrypha. Let's get the one in the Apocrypha real quick and we can open it up for, question, for questions from that point. I apologize for the time overlap. We really went over today. But I wanted to tackle this once and for all and have the whole understanding. The virgin birth ain't nothing you can teach in five minutes and you have the understanding. That deception is deeply grained within, d deep, d deeply embedded within all society to have you believe in the Queen Mother of Heaven. Because you're not just worshiping Christ with that understanding. You're acknowledging Mary above all women. When really, the only woman you should be looking at in this earth that we should be actually examining if a woman is trying to be virtuous, it's Sarah. You're not supposed to be looking, and you're not supposed to worship her either. But Sarah is the example of the woman. We should be, uh, uh, that a woman should be following or desire to be like. Read. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 1. Go ahead. I myself also am a mortal man. I also myself am. Am a mortal man. Go ahead. Like to all. Like to all. And the offspring of him that was first made of the earth. And in my mother's womb was I fashioned to be flesh in the time of ten months, being compacted in blood. Go ahead. Of the seed of man. Of the what? Of the seed of man. Of the seed of man. Read. And the pleasure that came with sleep. And the pleasure that came with sleep. That's when a man and woman go to bed. Verse 3. Read. And when I was born, I drew in the common air and fell upon the earth, which is of like nature. And the first voice I uttered was crying 
as all others do. Just like other children are born, go ahead. I was nursed in swaddling clothes. You know that Christ was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And that with cares. For there is no king that had any other beginning of birth. There is no king that have ha ever had any beginning of birth. And that's including our king, Yeshua, or whom you call Jesus Christ. Every king came exactly how I've just read out of, the, out of Wisdom of Solomon. There's no king that have come a different way. All kings have been born through the pleasure that comes with sleep. What is that? Intercourse. And Christ didn't even acknowledge his mother as some queen mother of heaven or this mother of God. Let's go to Luke the 8th chapter real quick. Luke 8 and 19. Let's see how Christ d dealt with Mary. St. Luke chapter 8 verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brother and could not come in at him for the press. So now his brother, brother, brethren, and his mother tried to get next to him once he became famous. Now notice it says his brethren to show you that Christ had brothers and he had sisters. So him dealing, her dealing with Joseph, that wouldn't be the first time with Christ that he, they actually laid down and had children. And see, I have to speak on this elementary on this level because Christians think that Mary didn't have children. This is how they're programmed. The, 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 she's this pure untouched woman that never had intercourse it says here then came to him his mother and his brethren and could not come at him for the press there were so many people pressing in the crowd read verse 20 and it was told him by certain which said thy mother and thy brethren stand without they say listen Christ I think your brother and sister your brothers and your family and your mother they, they're on the outside of the crowd and can't get in read Desiring to see thee. And they desiring to see you. They want to see you. Read. Verse 21. What did Yeshua say? And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren. My mother, my brothers. Are these which hear the word of the Most High. Are thee that hear the word of the Most High. And do it. And do it. Like if they were really down, they wouldn't be outside the crowd. They would have been here with me from the beginning. That's what Christ is saying. So he's not saying make a line for my mother and my blood family. So why Christians don't pull this? Why Catholics don't pull this scripture out? So Christ wasn't upholding his mother as some queen mother of heaven. And if you acknowledge the virgin birth and all those other variables which came through paganism and ancient history paganism, up to the Roman Catholic Church, up to the Satanist churches we have today, if you acknowledge that, brothers and sisters, you are not acknowledging Christ. You are not acknowledging the true power of the Most High. Those were lies and deception, things that Christ warned us about from the Roman Catholic Church. Read that again. Read Matthew, last scripture, Matthew 24, which says, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. St. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. Read it. And Yeshua answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Read it again. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Someone asked, Well, wouldn't the woman who also come from Israel or David like Mary be considered the seed of David? Of course the woman is the seed of David. But you have to look at the whole picture. Examine the, the oath the Most High gave David that through his son he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Nathan did not sit on the throne of David. Solomon did. Mary did not come through Solomon. Mary came through Nathan. Therefore, Mary do not fulfill that oath. She's out of the picture. There was no throne set up for Mary's foreparents. As far as Nathan goes, Solomon sat on the throne. And that's the throne that Christ would sit on. 
Because if you make that example, then you have to look at anybody then who came through David's loins. Why stop at Mary? Let's go some other place where David's children were born. So you can't do that. You must go strictly from that line of kings. David, Solomon, everyone you're, that's mentioned in Matthew, the first chapter, till it gets to Joseph. Christians ignore that whole thing and jump right to 18. So you can't say, well, Mary is through the seed of David because she do not exercise the point of kingship, which was the oath given to David in the Old Testament. The oath was not to Nathan. The oath was to David, down from David to Solomon. So you can't try to slip Mary up in there with Nathan. Okay? You can't do that. And here's my question. What's wrong with following the lineage in Matthew, the first chapter? What's the issue with that? It's there. It's written. Why can't we accept that? You know why? Because you've been programmed by the pagan Romans who follow the virgin queen of heaven. That's why. Hebrews, the second chapter, tell us that no other person have come any other way. That Christ had to come like us to secure us. All right? Now you see why we can't teach this in five minutes or in ten minutes? Because the virgin deception, there's so many areas of deception with, their, with that teaching. You've got to break down the history, the precepts, every part of it. Because they'll do anything to sneak their virgin mother up in there. All right? So with that, I hope you got some understanding. And uh, we'll open this up for questions. Now, after, after uh, she was impregnated, Joseph didn't touch her again until after she had Christ. And then he dealt with her again and had more children. All right. Luke's account was before Mary and Joseph dealt, so you can understand. All right. So let me open this up for questions real quick. We will go through the through the study on Sarah very soon. When you look at Proverbs 31, that woman is Sarah. It tell you in the book of Timothy that all the daughters of Zion should desire to be like the mother Sarah. How do we know that, uh, uh, that Luke, the third chapter, was talking about Mary's parents? Yes, when you do the research and you look at Heli and do the research on Heli, H-E-L-I, th through history material, you will know that Heli was Mary's father. That's why the lineage has changed after David in Luke and after David in Matthew. Okay? Do the research on Heli. Also, a lot of brothers and sisters get carried away with that having child of the Holy Spirit. And I notice Christians uh, link into that, saying, well, see, look at this. But what they ignore, it said the same thing for John the Baptist in the, in the first chapter when it come to his mother, Elizabeth. It tell you that the Holy Spirit came into the woman and she kicked in the belly. That the baby kicked in the belly. It lets you know that John the Baptist also, that the Holy Spirit overshadowed and filled Elizabeth. So are we saying that John the Baptist came to a virgin birth? So why they skip over the same stories of another person and go straight to Mary? 
That's the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? That's the Roman Catholic Church. Read, yeah, Matthew 1 and 24 is talking about that, yes. When it says jo Joseph knew her not, he didn't deal with her again until after Christ was conceived. He didn't touch her. They went through with the ceremony, he left her alone, and after she was conceived, they dealt again and had children. All right? But the fulfillment of prophecy when it says that Christ must come through the seed of David. Mary have no seed. All right? If it's according to Christ Christians with no man, that means Christ do not have a nation. And see, and that's what they want you to believe. They want you to believe that Christ is this man that's of all people, all nations, and no race. If a man don't have a father, he don't have a race or a nation he belongs to. That's the Christ the Christians are teaching. Someone asked about Satan in the book of Job. Even after Satan fell, he had access to go back to the throne. He could go back forth to the throne to accuse the brethren up until the time that Christ was crucified. And it tells us that in uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter. The accuser of our brethren have been cast down. No, Joseph of Arimathea is not Joseph the father. He was a rich guy who was a convert who believed in Christ, who helped with the burial. Uh, when it says he was born in sin, it tells you that he came through sinful flesh. How can he teach us to overcome sin if he wasn't born just like us? That's what it tells us in Hebrew. He has to come like us to show us that conquering sin in the flesh is possible. Uh, someone asked about the owls of the Gentiles. In Genesis, it's not speaking of just Japheth being Gentiles. It's telling you where Japheth will reside. When you look at the Isles of the Gentiles, that whole land around the Mediterranean Sea, that's where Ham was right off of Egypt, and that's where Japheth was right at, at the coast of different parts of uh, the Mediterranean. So it's not saying that, these, that Japheth is the only Gentiles. I don't know what people are saying. The Isles of the Gentiles is where the other nations predominantly were at after Noah's Ark settled. So it's not saying that Japheth are the only Gentiles. I don't know where people are getting that at. Okay. Get Hela out of the Bible dictionary real quick. H-E-L-I. Get Hela. Mary father name was not Joseph. Mary father name is Heli. Uh, Heli. It says uh, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Or perhaps. Or perhaps what? The father of Mary. Or perhaps the father of Mary. And that's why you see as it was supposed, they put in parentheses, as it was supposed Anything in parentheses was not there during the, the original translation in Luke 3. If you see something in parentheses, it was not there in the original translation. It was injected. 
Heli is the father of Mary. The curse of, uh, uh, of Jeconias and his children is what happened to them after we fell in the Babylonian captivity. No longer would they sit on the throne. And that's what happened. Slavery and captivity happened and took him and his children from the throne. So that was already established. Some people look at that and say, well, the scriptures say that none of his sons will ever sit on the throne. It was talking about what happened in past history. It didn't say that it wouldn't happen in the future. Mind you, there's Old Testament scriptures saying, telling us that a king would come and sit on David's throne. So people use that so that they can deny Christ. But listen, if you want to deny Christ, that's on you. You have no part in the kingdom of heaven. If you deny Christ before men, the Christ will deny you before the Father. So you best be safe and just acknowledge Christ. Again, for those in Luke, the second chapter, as you can see, Mary is not being called Joseph's wife. This was before their intercourse. I said it clearly earlier that Luke's account happened before she was pregnant. Matthew's account, she's pregnant. You, you got it. Are the angels that dealt with women part of the legions that fell with Satan? No, they're not. That happened at a different time during the time of, of around uh, Enoch, during the time of Enoch. Ephraim is the father of the so-called Puerto Ricans. When you see Ephraim, you know it's also speaking about them, the so-called Puerto Ricans, and also the sons of Joseph, which encompasses Manasseh also. Okay, I hope you all got that understanding today. Someone asks, will I discuss Jeremiah 22 and 30 on Blog Talk Radio with Brother Soul in Black? No, I will not. And I'll tell you why. If, if he can just focus on that and not focus on the prophecies concerning Christ, then it's futile because all through the Old Testament, it's the prophecies of Christ. You get on these shows and you talk to these guys who don't want to acknowledge Christ. It's futile. You'll get them in one spot and you'll talk to them and say, well, what about that? And automatically they'll jump someplace else. I don't have no time for it. If they want to set up a radio show to deny Christ, we don't want to be no part of it. Let him stick with Jeremiah 22 and, and, and see what that does for him. Because number one, if Christ is not the sacrifice, someone need to ask anyone that don't want to follow Christ, why aren't you sacrificing right now? If Christ is not the king, why, are, if, if he died on the cross so that we, we can be without sacrifice. So why is it you're living under Christ's grace, but yet you are operating and claiming that Christ is not king? So no, I don't have no time to go on some station and argue something which is minute and it's futile if people want to deny Christ we have nothing to do with it I'm not here to argue whether or not Christ is the Savior we here to put this out into the wind and those who believe in Christ shall be saved we're gonna do a, another advanced lesson this coming uh, next 
Friday. Okay? Someone says, if not, how do you resolve the curses placed over Kaniah's lineage? We don't resolve it. Do you see someone sitting on the throne of, of, of David right now? Do you see Judah sitting on the throne? So we are suffering the curses of Kaniah right now. That's how you resolve it. Where Judah sitting on the throne at? So we're suffering the curses. That's how you resolve it. Showing during that time of Kaniah, we lost the throne. We went under Babylonian captivity, and we've been slaves ever since. When Christ came, he didn't sit on no throne. What do you see when Christ came, what throne did he have with the disciples? Go to Matthew 19 and 27. This is how you resolve it. So these guys who are trying to deny Christ and going into Kaniah and, 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 and Joe Kaniah, they are babes in the word. They are totally young in the understanding of the Bible. Common sense would tell you that the scriptures was fulfilled because there was no one from Judah who sat on the throne since then. When Christ came, he did not sit on the throne. So he need to get out of Jeremiah 22 and go someplace else. Because that's, that's, if that's where he's sticking at, he, he need to learn again. Get Matthew 19 and 27. Read it. St. Matthew chapter 19 verse 27. Read it. Then answered Peter and said unto him, go ahead. Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? What shall we have therefore? Read. Verse 28. And Yeshua saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne. Ye that follow me in the regeneration. That's not reincarnation. That's talking about the Most High regenerating our flesh and our spirit again. When we become new, when the dead in Christ shall rise. It says, when ye who follow me in the regeneration, read, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne. When the Son of Man shall sit on the throne, proving to you that Christ did not sit on any throne when he came. Read. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Go ahead. Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So when someone go into the curse of Jeremiah 22, you look at him and say, Look at us. Do it look like Judah sitting on a throne to you? We are suffering the curses. We're still under it. What are you talking about? Did Christ sit on a throne when he came? So what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Christ will fulfill that when he come back, when he returns. Okay. Christ will fulfill that when he returns. That's how you answer that. I've dealt with people with Jeremiah 22 all day, and they sit there and look, and it's this blank stare they have on their face when you finally explain it to them. And, it, and, and, and they, they wondered why they waste so much time on something that was futile. And what I ask when they come there, I'm like, the first thing I ask is, are you trying to say Christ is not the Savior? That, is, that's why you're going there? Because Christ didn't sit on the throne when he came. So what are you going there for now? These are the same people who want to deny Christ, and we have no time for it. Okay? So that's how we resolve it. We resolve it by saying, any man who deny Christ before man, Christ will deny you before the Father. So if you don't know, break down and get a teacher. Stop, stop being YouTube and, and internet teachers when you haven't learned anything. If you sit there and you stuck on Jeremiah 22 and don't know about Christ, then you, you haven't learned. Someone asks, how do we know we are Hebrews if we can't track our grandparents? Faith, 
Well, there's only curses that pertains to our foreparents. Right now, a Chinese person can't say, a Chinese person uh, uh, in Upper China cannot say that they're Hebrews if they didn't suffer the curses written of in the scriptures. Did they go into cargo slave ships? Did they suffer what Deuteronomy 28 says? The Most High is perfect in his prophecy. Now, you shouldn't strive in genealogy, but the Most High makes it clear who his people is according to prophecy. Let's see here. Someone says, an elder told me that 144,000 are governments. The 144,000 are who we see in Revelations, the seventh chapter. They are 144,000 men of the tribes of Israel. They will be set up under Christ, the 12 disciples, to be the governing body or the leaders of this new kingdom that's coming with Christ. I don't know any Hebrews that didn't go into captivity in, in some fashion, in some fashion. Okay? Even the people over in Africa are serving the Western world, and they didn't go anywhere. Let's see here. For those who haven't received their... Uh, your results, you'll receive your results soon for the academy. For those who haven't received it, just hold tight. Check your emails and check your spam to make sure. But there's some people who we're still checking, so. Will the 144,000 be the only Israelite men in the kingdom? No, they will not. When you read Revelation 7, you go on down, it talks about a multitude which no man can number out of every kindred, nation, and tongue. The 144,000 are the leaders. Can we give a precept showing that the 144,000 are men? Go to Revelation 15, Revelation 7, and Ezekiel 9 and 4. I know we're about to break. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, uh, verse. Revelation 7, and read where it says 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. Uh, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, how do we know those are men? Hold that and get Revelations 15 and 1. Uh, Revelations chapter 15, verse 1. Read it. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of the Most High. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. And them that have gotten the victory over the beast, go ahead. And over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of the Most High. Go ahead. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the Lamb, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou mm -hmm. King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? I want the one where it talks about the mark. About the name of the Most High. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Re that's the one I want. Revelation 14 and 1. Read. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with them in hundred and forty and four thousand. Same ones you read in Revelation 7. Read. Having his father's name written in their foreheads. Has, having his father's name written in their forehead. So they know the name of the Most High, these 144,000. Okay, it's not talking about a bunch of people running around speaking the Tetragrammaton. 
It's going to be 144,000 with the Most High's name sealed in their mind. Now hold that and get Ezekiel 9 and 4. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. Read. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city. Go through the midst of the city. Through the midst of Jerusalem. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Know that the mark of the seal of the Most High is on these 144,000 according to Revelations 15 and Revelation 7. Read. Verse 5. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after them, go ye after him. Go back to Revelations, I mean, Ezekiel 9 and 4 again and read it. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men. The women. The men. The children. The men. The women. The men. The, the what? The men. The who? The men. The men. M-E-N. The mark is on the men. The 144,000 are men. Can you see that? Now they are sealed, the blood of Christ seal the women and children who are under that man's mark. The same as the blood that was on the door coming out of Egypt during the Passover. If that man's house had the blood on the door, then the death angel would pass over the whole house. The whole house under that man was protected. So even though it's 144,000, there's many people that falls under that one man's mark. Okay? Do we deal with the gospel of the Holy Twelve of the Essenes? No, that is total madness. We got one more scripture, then we got to pray out because we wail over the time. Go to Colossians 2 and 14 through 16. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. Read it. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What was the ordinances that was against us? The ordinances that was against us was the law of death. If we didn't follow some of these ordinances, it meant death. How did Christ blot out death? He died for us. So that's not saying blotting out all the laws that the Christians are speaking of. He blotted out the fact that we're not judged immediately for sin. That's death. Read. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. Go ahead. Nailing it to, the, to his cross. So when Christ was nailed to the cross, what happened to him? He died. So that's the part of the law he took out of the way. The fact that if we sin, immediately you die. That what was nailed to the cross, not all the laws. If that's the case, people can do whatever they want then. Read. Verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Go ahead. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. Let no man for, therefore judge you in meat or drink. Read. Or in respect of an holy day. That means if someone don't follow the Sabbath, we can't go amongst them and start killing them. Because according to Numbers, the 15th chapter, if you were working on the Sabbath or you didn't follow the Sabbath, you would die. That's death. So that's not saying that Sunday worship is okay. That's saying that through the grace of Christ, we can't judge you for not following the Sabbath. But that's not stopping the Most High from judging you. He said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's what he said. So if you don't follow it after you've been warned, then when the judgment come, you have to face the Most High with that. So we're not going to judge somebody according to them not following the Sabbath. Have you ever seen us running inside a church and start killing people because they were there on Sundays? Where's the judgment? We're not doing nothing to nobody. We're telling people 
that Sunday worship is not the day the Most High said worship. We're not judging you. Read. Let no man therefore judge you and me. So we don't judge you when you don't eat the right things. Read. Or in drink. Or when you drink the right things. We're not doing nothing according to the law against you. Read. Or in respect of an holy day. So if you don't follow the Sabbath, we can't go into the law and judge you accordingly. Read. Or of the new moon. Or of the new moon. Or of the Sabbath days. Or of the Sabbath day. So we can't go and do those things. Okay? We can't judge someone accordingly. Okay? Last but not least before I go. There's a new statement out there. You're welcome. So we're not judging. Judging means going into the law and seeing who's breaking the Sabbath and then doing to them according to that judgment, like the Pharisees used to do. When they brought Mary Magdalene before Christ, when she was caught in the act of adultery, they was ready to judge her according to the law. Don't worry about that Ephraimite 777. He's been banned. Don't even worry about that. He's gone. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing is this. Last but not least, when it comes to uh, the academy, there's a new statement out there where people are claiming that uh, it's selling the gospel or selling the word. It's amazing to me how people come up with this stuff. Number one, I don't know anyone out there who went into a Christian Bible store to buy their Bible, who've come down on, the, on that particular store for selling them the word. Why is it, we're not selling Bibles here. So why is it we're, we're antagonized because we want a private class for brothers and sisters who want a private setting to learn? And they're not being forced to do it. This is what they want. But yet, Christians are selling Bibles all over the place. And no one is saying anything about them selling the word. Now that's selling the word. Shouldn't Bibles be free then? See, but it's a problem when they see brothers are doing something and the work is fruitful. That's the problem. They're just upset because if they had a class, no one would want to pay for that. No one wants to deal with their madness. No one wouldn't pay two cents to hear anything from them because they not people wouldn't pay for the class if they wasn't getting something from it. Okay, and I'm glad we have it this way. And when I hear these statements and all that, it's good because these people shouldn't be in it anyway. This is the way we know that whoever wants to be in the class, they really want to be in it. They want to be a part of it. So I'm glad that there's a price for the class. Because we will be contended with people like that and the lessons will never get taught for those who came in the right spirit. They would come in to disrupt, bring madness, bring their opinion and all of that. And I love the way the classes are constructed because it allows people to grow and learn in a short time. Okay. So I just want to make that clear for you, brothers and sisters, okay?